Yes, you see it on the screen, building a data-driven bank, and Felipe Mello is here to walk us through it. For the last 12 years, he uh, worked in startups and corporations. He was playing with data, AI, and architecture, and now he's going to tell us more about building a data-driven bank. I think it's uh, interesting to say that Felipe uh, holds two patents in the fields of audio and pattern recognition, big data and distributed systems, and also web mining and recommended systems. He's also a rock drummer and a fiction writer. So hopefully you enjoyed the party yesterday. Yes. Yeah, we had <laughs> some rock drummers. So okay, with a round of applause, let's welcome Felipe. Okay. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Let me just set the timer here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for joining me here today. Okay, all good. So yes, we'll be talking about how to design a data-driven bank. It's something that we have been doing at ABSA, actually. It's a journey we are taking. So we'll be exploring ABSA as some kind of a case study. And um, so just to introduce myself, I'm currently a principal engineer at ABSA playing with uh, machine learning, data, and architecture. I've been there for like the last five years. So previously, I was also a data scientist. Before that, I was a data engineer when it was still part of Barclays. And then uh, before that, um, I co-founded this uh, company called Soundview in Brazil. So it was basically audio analytics. Yeah, and then some other stuff. So that's about myself and about ABSA itself. So we are a Pan-African financial services provider. And then we play, we play in in pretty much everything that banking does. Uh, so retail, business, corporate, and so on. So we are present in like 15 countries, uh, listed in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And we also have this uh, R&D office in Prague, which is where I'm based. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, we'll get into the agenda here. So uh, we'll be exploring it like this. I would like to speak about some opportunities that I believe that we have in banks, but actually not only in banks, in, but in pretty much every big corporation that has been adopting technology since a, a, a long time ago, so like early adopters. And then the challenges that we face to materialize those opportunities, and then, of course, the approaches to overcome those challenges, and then the new challenges that come out of those approaches, and then what we can see from the future. Okay? So, um, Again, what I'm going to present here about opportunities, except for the next slide, is true for banks, for, in my understanding at least, for banks, for car makers, for insurance companies, for governments, and you understand why in a while. But from the financial perspective, um, we have this study from McKinsey, which says that we have that number in terms of uh, potential for, for uh, AI-generated uh, revenue. And it is being divided here between traditional AI and advanced AI. So the way I interpret it is like tabular data and deep learning. And then as we can see, bottom left, we have marketing and sales as the biggest number. And we will be exploring that here today. And also we have been doing something in these other operations as well, which is related to automation. So this is the financial opportunity. But this is the interesting part, in my opinion. And this is why I'm saying that it, it's not only about banking. We are talking about uh, different industries, actually. So we have decades of data gathering because we know these corporations, they have been adopting technology before anyone else. And actually, because of that, they have been built on top of legacy systems, we, which we explore. But nevertheless, we are uh, uh, actually standing on a huge amount of data. Also, we have this unprecedented increase in data flow. So it's exploding, I don't need to say that. And then we have what has enabled big data slash AI, which is a substantial decrease in the cost of computing, like in both storage and processing. And of course, because of that, so now we have data and then we have computing power. So uh, we have advances in computational techniques and tools. So we are seeing what neural networks are doing these days. And um, we are talking about dozens of millions of customers in the case of ABSA, but again, true for, for every big uh, industry, every big player in these industries. And maybe especially we have tech-savvy generations uh, like that, that can use data products and so on. So this is a huge opportunity. Talking about now value generation. Uh, so this stuff about big data, 
Actually, the way I interpret it is like this. Big data allows personalization. If you have personalization, you can, be, you can have better product fit. So better product fit, fit makes happier customers. And happier customers, of course, they are loyal, they're more loyal. And that means sustained revenue. New revenue, you can acquire new customers, especially sustained sustain revenue, because keeping the, the customers these days is complicated. So this is what we can have, let's say, from a marketing perspective, if we refer back to those financial numbers. But there's also opportunity in automation, because um, talking about banks, again, all, every industry, so they have been standardizing processes for quite a long time. And if you have a process that is standardized, you apply AI to that, you can automate. And then, of course, you improve performance, which means that you can save costs. So this is kind of the opportunities that we have. So lots of data, computational techniques. And yeah. Now, how can we actually materialize that? And this is the, probably the interesting part in here. So um, for those of you working on data in general, if you work for big corporations, this is probably your painful reality. So accessing data is very complicated. Um, first of all, these industries are based on mainframes, so it's very complicated to play with. And these companies have verticals, so inside a bank, you have retail bank, and then you have, I don't know, investment bank and corporate bank, and they don't talk to one another. There's no connection. So this is, this is the very definition of a data silo. And if you have data silos, of course, it's very hard to discover data. So discoverability is, is quite poor. And if you cannot discover data, you cannot uh, basically create a source of truth, which, which is a unified vision of the data that you have. And when you find the data, you have these issues, incompleteness, you have hacked schemas, because what happens is someone comes in, starts to develop a database, but then later the person leaves, someone else comes in, and instead of trying to understand what was being done, something completely new is started. Okay? So that generates duplications. We also have the, the challenge with, with unstructured data. And we know when it comes to data, it's garbage in, garbage out. And also we have an issue with workforce. And uh, we know that very well. Uh, our LinkedIn's probably are being bombarded every day with uh, job opportunities. It's very hard to find. The moment you find, it's very hard to scale. So you can bring someone who is very skilled, but it's, uh, uh, Federating that knowledge is super complicated. And if you talk from a business perspective, if it's hard and kind of expensive to get people, so maybe they will say, okay, maybe let's buy something instead of building. And then I would advocate against that as well. But these are the challenges, okay? So technical challenges, uh, we do have a little bit of uh, business challenges here as well. Um, and just to present the size of the challenge, there is this... Uh, this compilation of numbers here. So talking about mainframes, and uh, of course, people working on modern stacks, they know nothing about this stuff, and if that's your case, you're very lucky. But um, so they are the base of pretty much all those industries. And they are used by 71% of these uh, Fortune 500 companies. 87% of all credit card transactions in the world are still processed by mainframes. So that's big data in its very essence. You know, that's how data is being ingested, transactional data. So, and then you can see how important it is in banks, like 92 out, out of the 100 uh, biggest banks in the world rely on mainframes. So there is no way for you to simply move a business out of mainframe and onto a, a new stack. It's very complicated. These new banks, the ones that are uh, starting now, like Mons or Revolut, maybe they don't have those issues. But the, the, the incumbents, the big ones that have been around for quite a while, they do. And then, if you want to leverage that data to become data-centric, you face two problems. The very high cost of hardware, so that you can scale your operations to, to do model training, for example. And, of course, the, the business model is super expensive. It, it charges you by MIPS, millions of instructions per second. So think about training some kind of neural net that takes three days on top of that. So you go bankrupt. So that's yet another challenge, so what you get out of legacy systems. Now, um, of course, there's more problems. I try to compile here what I believe are the most important and maybe more appealing to, 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 to us, to this audience. Now I will talk about the approaches that we have been taking to 
tackle some of those problems. Okay? So we know that when we are creating a tech team these days to play with data, first of all, we are talking about data engineering. If you remember, someone said some time ago, data science was the sexiest job, and it's no longer. Data engineer is. And what I saw happening in lots of companies, including mine, is that lots of data scientists started to be hired, you know, and, and going to conferences and stuff. And then they started to be fired because there was no data. They realized there was no data for a data scientist to play with. So data engineer is the very base of everything. And then I believe that the first step is to have a streamlined data engineering uh, team that will leverage open source solutions to avoid vendor lock-in, basically. And then whenever you identify uh, gaps in those tools, you contribute back to the community. I'll, I'll, mo uh, I'll show some examples here as well and how they pay in the long run. Now, once you have the data, you need to create features. And then two types of data here, tabular data and deep learning stuff. So one thing that we have uh, identified, I'll show, is that if you create cross-domain features, so for example, features from transactional banking combined with features from savings, from investments, from loans, you can streamline the whole data science process. Um, and then you will be able to, to, to answer a question like this. Can a customer's transactional behavior predict the need for a loan? So it's kind of cross-domain. If, if, if you can scale that, you can gain a lot, and I'll prove. Finally, uh, of course, we are talking about deep learning, so it's all the same, so just a different type of data. And then, considering that you have the data gathering, data engineering happening properly, and then you have your features, now it's time for you to streamline the modeling part. So we need to retrain, you know, there's data drift, there's concept drift. Uh, we need to integrate that with the business, we need to do monitoring, so that's MLOps. We need to standardize that as well. Okay, so I will speak about these three, uh, let's say, lines of approach. Talking about platforms first, before I get into the architecture and the cool stuff. So talking about operations, um, we have two use cases, and I think everyone has the same use cases. So we have batch processing and we have online processing. So batch processing happens every one week, one month, two weeks, it's something that happens and then stops. But we also have online uh, 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 use cases that require, for example, the establishment of an API, so that uh, you, can, you can query that in real time. And, of course, we have different functions, different uh, skill sets, so data engineer and data science and so on. So what we need, so that we avoid having scattered teams and scattered pieces of infrastructure, is a centralized platform that will connect those functions, like data engineering with data science, seamlessly, so that you know the boundaries, so data engineering ends here, here starts data science, and so on. It must serve all the use cases, and it, it, must, be, it must clarify the trade-off between buying and building. So this is how you convince business to get more people to build the products instead of buying, and of course, to show, okay, in this case, it's much cheaper and you know, it's much more efficient for everyone to just buy. And yeah, there's something about introducing a tooling team here, which is something that we've done at ABSA. And I need to mention this because I'll be mentioning these tools in the next diagram and, and, and after that as well. So we have been, as I mentioned, leveraging uh, open source tools. And whenever we find gaps in those tools, we fill those gaps and we contribute back to the community. So here are some examples of some open source tools uh, that we have. So Pramen is a uh, Spark framework that supports data injection. So with data injection, data quality, uh, so we developed that, it's open source, you can use. Py2K is a Python library that allows you to connect a Pandas data frame with Kafka and Schema Registry, but other messaging tools as well. So imagine that you're playing with, com with Pandas. You need to, to, to send this data to Kafka, or to some messaging system. Uh, you can just use this library and say send, and then it will go. Then we also developed Abris, which is the same, but it's for Scala, and, uh, and, but it does the same thing instead of Python and Scala. Hyperdrive is a tool that we also developed for, for pluggable transformations in, on top of Spark as well. So as you're using streaming data, um, 
you want to provide different transformations in here, you can use Hyperdrive. Subatomic is a tool that will basically connect your code base with some CI CD tool, for example, Jenkins. So you click one button, everything is streamlined with pre-configured files that you can just uh, put some specific fields. And uh, we are now developing Feature Maker and Model Maker to assist in, of course, making features and deploying models. Now, getting into the interesting stuff. <coughs> this is the architecture, the MLOps, data ops architecture that we have playing on-prem right now. And it goes pretty much like this. So we have the different sources, like mainframes, applications, emails, and so on. Then we have Pramen doing the ingestion into a data lake, which is basically uh, on top of HDFS. Then we have train in general, and the trained models go to HDFS as well, some kind of model registry. Then we have feature generation, and then we have model execution that will basically load the model, execute the features, use Py2K to send those predi predictions to Kafka. Then we have Hyperdrive, uh, which uses Abris to offload that data into Hive, which is also on, on, on HDFS. And then we expose a JDBC uh, endpoint in there. The client can access the data. So this is what we have running on-prem for batch use case. For online use case, um, for example, the automation stuff that I will explain, it is yet another solution. So we have a code repository, and uh, of course, it will generate some models. Then we have Subatomic integrating that with a CI CD solution, so GitHub Actions, Jenkins, whatever. And then we just tweak the script a little bit to load the right model. It's being deployed on Kubernetes. Uh, we do have some monitoring, of course. And then we expose those endpoints through REST or some messaging mechanism. Now. We talked about centralizing a platform because we need a team to maintain this and another team to maintain the previous piece of architecture. But it, it, it's, it's very costly. Huh? So there is this very interesting paper in here. Um, I recommend for every, anyone interested in, in MLOps. But this is some kind of reference architecture for MLOps. So it's a unified platform. But this is very cluttered. Okay, so what we did actually is we just simplified it so that. So this is a solution that is able to uh, basically address all of those points that we mentioned previously. So it goes pretty much like this. And this is our reference architecture that we are actually moving to the cloud. Um, so you have the sources, then we use Premen to send the data into a data lake. Then we have Feature Store, which is the tool that we, we developed sending it into a feature store. Then uh, we can experiment with that. So data scientists will load the data directly from the lake or from the feature store, do the experimentation. Then once they are happy, they will use the model making to send the model into a model registry. After that, it gets deployed somewhere, and uh, I'll explain where. And then it's invoked, of course, it's monitor. And then we have the, the customers, like for uh, batch cases, the result is sent to some sync. In the online use case, the, the customer will just connect to that through, let's say, a REST API and get the data. Now, you see, it is unified, one, two. It separates, it creates boundaries between the functions. So you see everything in, in white, the left side, is data ops and also tooling. And I mentioned the introduction of a tooling team. So that's data ops. Then everything in green is data science or ML ops. So it's more on the machine learning side, data science side. Everything here in gray is the DevOps piece, as you can see. And that blue piece is the handshake between data engineering and data science, because these functions are getting convoluted, and machine learning, engineering, and so on, so many titles. But then there's the handshake in there. So it's like this. Data engineering, you get me the data all the way to the feature store. Now I have features. Data scientists, OK, you can uh, search for features that already exist or create your own, and then you can deploy your model. Of course, you can build your models, you deploy, they will be deployed based on the use case, and so on. To give some, num uh, some names to these elements, we can talk, we can consider something like this. Maybe you have some databases that hold the data, or maybe it's coming through Kafka or Kinesis or whatever, whatever. And then, or mainframes. Then we have Pramen ingesting it into, let's say, let's say S3, and then we put a lake house on top of that. 
Then we have a Databricks feature store, and then we have some Jupyter notebooks for exploration. Then you can either deploy the notebooks or create an application using Model Maker. You deploy that into MLflow, and then, uh, sorry, you uh, store it there. Then you can deploy it into EC2, Elastic Memory does, Reduce, Lambdas, Elastic, Kubernetes, whatever you want, the, what fits your, the use case. Then you monitor it with something like Grafana, Datadog. And then you can query these models uh, using REST, for example, if that's an online use case, or you can have some kind of scatterer that will generate the results for you, dumping it into S3 or Kafka, some, some storage layer. That is the batch use case. So you see, we are serving both use cases here right now. So that's how we are, we are streamlining the platform side of things. And uh, before I finish that, I would like to present one very interesting use case that shows why building and investing in research, is, it, it actually pays a lot. So one problem uh, that we had in data engineering is that uh, accessing data from mainframes is complicated, as I mentioned. It's expensive, we don't have tools. If you decide to use those tools, you, you have some kind of vendor lock-in. It's complicated stuff. And processing COBOL. So COBOL is an old language. You, you cannot find uh, people to work on that. So bad stuff. Um, now, it's, uh, it's very expensive, as I mentioned, and there's lots of gaps in the open source space as well. So you cannot actually find a tool that will process COBOL for you, because that's a very lucrative business model for the companies uh, that, that provide mainframes. So this is the second batch of uh, open source tools that we have. There's many more, uh, but the one that I'll be mentioning is Cobrix. So Cobrix is a COBOL parser for Spark. So it's pretty much like this. This is, this is how you, you run COBOL. COBOL has two parts. It has a so-called data file, which is basically a collection of binary data, and you have the records. And uh, you have some kind of schema, which is called copybook. So you put the copybook on the data, you have the final result. Okay? That's as simple as that. But doing that processing is something that is super complicated. And now imagine. You have three different teams working on the same data set. So one team is coming and basically uh, loading the data, doing the processing. And then you have another team that is pretty much loading the same data set, so you're paying twice because you pay per use, as I mentioned. So it's very complicated. So what we, we thought is this. If we can somehow create our own COBOL parser, we can have something like this. So mainframes, we just lift and shift the data into a data lake, then we can process that in a distributed way using Spark, for example. And this is what we accomplish, and the API is as simple as this. So there is an example copybook. Here is binary data. That's how you do it. Read for me using that copybook this data, and then it's running for you in a Spark cluster in a distributed way. So of course, the result is the cost of processing that on top of mainframe decreased to just a small fraction of what it used to be. There's no vendor lock-in, so open source tools. And we are helping the business to tap on, on its huge uh, data sources. It's something that didn't happen before. And of course, we contributed back to the community. So it's, uh, we, are, we are receiving pull requests and so on. So this is one example. There was one investment. Two, two people developed this uh, system. So huge return over investment. And, okay, so I spoke about platforms. So I'm trying to tell a story here um, or of how to design this data-driven bank. So now we have a platform, we have the, the tools and stuff. Now it's time to talk about the applications. So this is how we structure um, our team, our space, basically. We have the infrastructure layer, and then we have the operations layer, so DevOps, DataOps, MLOps, and so on. Then we have a tooling layer, uh, which I, I presented some of those tools that they developed. And then we have these verticals there that are the use cases. So I'll be exploring CVM and document analysis, um, Axis, whichever other use cases are built. So CVM stands for Customer Value Management. Basically, what it does is customer understanding. So it's the, the typical data science task. And it tries to generate leads. For example, which customers would be good leads to receive a credit card ad? or, I don't know, a, a savings product ad. And of course, the challenges are the same that everyone faces. Modeling, feature engineering uh, in general. So how do you create the features so that uh, 
not only you put them in the feature store and they become discoverable, but also that you can trace the lineage. So you can understand which data sets were basically joined. And, uh, but above all, they need to be explainable because the moment you, s you, you, you tell the business, okay, this is a good lead, they'll ask why. And then you need to be able to explain. This is an issue, for example, with neural nets uh, that uh, we, we were able to overcome by using another approach. And then, of course, we need to decrease the time to market. Um, we don't want to spend eight months to, to just deliver the first model. So one thing that we know after this paper here, tabular data and then deep learning is not all that you need. I think it was a response to another paper that was uh, attention is all that you need, saying that if you have a, an attention-based neural network, that's all that you, you need to solve a problem. But we know <coughs> that it, when it comes to tabular features, tabular data, so data that comes in a table, you cannot do much better than a gradient boosted tree of some sort, like an XG boost, get boost, and so on. Okay, so if, if we know that, we know that this is a problem that can be uh, highly assisted by auto ML, automatic machine learning. So this is a, one example, this is a from PyCarrot, for example. And what it does is basically you generate the features, it will search for you across the, the, the different models, the hyperparameter settings, and then it will show you according to the different, different metrics that you decide. So it will search the right model for you. And, uh, and we know from a scientific, scientific fact that it's quite effective. It's tabular data. So the issue now becomes, how can we uh, generate features effectively? And then this is one uh, example. I think this one is very interesting. So when COVID started, someone from credit risk came to us and said, okay, which customers are at risk? And then we asked, at risk of what? And then they said, I don't know. I need to know which customers are at risk. And I need data to show me the definition of risk because it's, it's something completely new to have something like that. So what we started to do was basically to, to uh, calculate some metrics about customers that could be used in analytics tools. So this is an example of a, some kind of drill down on a given customer. And then uh, what, what it says is this. Um, this is the average income of this uh, given customer across the last six months. So 15,366.78. Uh, and this is the average expenses of this, this customer here. So o over the last six months. Now, when the, the way we use this is in a batch mode. So on the first day of the month, we go there and we, we generate this for every customer. Okay, so let's say that we went 1st of December and we generated this for this, this customer. So on that specific month, on the previous month, sorry, November, considering that we are doing this 1st uh, of December, so for November, the income was just 1,000 and the expenses became 18,000. So that corresponds to a 93% deviation in income and a 23% deviation in expenses. Plus, in the previous month, so in this case it would be October, the income was this and the expenses was this. So very close to the average. But now all of a sudden you have this decrease. And this client in special had a, a variation of just 4% in income and of 1% in expenses. So it's a huge variation. So it's a, it's a huge indication that this, this customer is at risk. Okay, so, and this is very easy to explain to the business. So what we did is uh, we, we put this and some other met metrics um, into the, those uh, auto ML uh, capabilities. And basically, <coughs> sorry, this is what we got in the end. So the models, uh, they worked as expected. And we got these metrics that are, uh, or features that are very easy to explain. So if the business asks, okay, why did you send me that guy? Uh, to, to be at risk, or what, what actually defines uh, someone who is at risk, because I didn't know that up front. And then you can say, okay, according to the model, it's the, let's say, the last transacted amount. It has a, it's very important to understand risk, or it's the number of outbound transactions that this, this client has. And also, it's very easy to explain. Business, they, they understand it. So if you approach feature generation as analytics, and if you leverage the the fact that for tabular data, um, uh, a gradient boosted tree of some sort will do, you can leverage auto ML. So in the, in the very end, uh, we took, I think, 
nine months to deliver the first model. So this new 2x, uh, it means um, it's the lead that to generate. So identifying new customers to credit cards, new customers to transactional products, to overdraft products, and so on. So the first one took nine months. Now we can deploy only one between two and four weeks. And just by using the, those features, because they are reusable. It's easy to discover. And uh, basically, this is what we got as numbers. So the response, like when you send a lead, you need a response. It increased by 300%. So I think it's a big number. The take-up rate, which means when you offer a product, the client not only visualizes the message, uh, but it, it, they also take the product. So it improved. So we get something between 2 and 15% improvement. It may look uh, a, small, a small number, but if we consider like 50,000 customers being targeted, it, it's quite substantial. And then, as I mentioned, the models now get deployed um, end to end in one month or less. And then, of course, this is a way to help the business to become data driven because we are using the data that it has to drive business decisions. So I think it's a, it's a big win from this perspective. Um, the last uh, thing that I'll present from, from this perspective is the the, the document analysis uh, challenge that we have here. So we have this use case. And uh, maybe that's something that all of you have, have been through. When you send a form to the bank, let's say you're applying for a loan, you have to fill a form and then you have to submit some of your documents, uh, like IDs or passports and so on. And then the way it's processed is someone will receive that and manually extract the data and feed that into another application which is very, very error-prone, okay? and it takes a lot of time to do. So, but this process is quite standardized. So as we discussed in the very beginning, we can ap apply AI to that and improve the process. Um, and this is what we, we try to do here using computer vision. And not, actually, not only computer vision, computer vision, OCR, and some other stuff. But the challenge with this is basically that uh, we have skewed images. So someone will scan the image, and the image will come Instead of this, it will come like this, so you have to disqueue it first to apply OCR. Um, you have to classify different document types. So in South Africa, for example, uh, ABSA is based in South Africa, a birth certificate is very similar to a death certificate. The template is very similar. So for those familiar with uh, convolutional neural networks, for example, um, they, they, they can get confused. Uh, of course, we don't have uh, labeled data as much as we would like to. There's some service level agreements, very hard to scale, and different types of AI tasks, as I mentioned. So the way we have architectured this so that we can scale the development uh, in here and also the, the processing time is like this. First of all, we created these different models. So we have one model to do the skewing, another model to do classification, another one to do OCR, and so on. They're all independent. And then we deploy them as microservices, like this. And we use the sidecar pattern here just to kind of abstract the communication layer. So we have Fluent D just to, to um, collect metrics and, and then so that we can do some monitoring. And then we have this orchestrator that we orchestrate use cases. So one use case might say, OK, I need to disqueue a model, run OCR, and get the result, and that's it. Some other use cases, they might, they might say, OK, I want to disqueue it, but uh, I also want to identify some signatures are present. So we, we can keep adding these use cases. We have this orchestrator calling based on the use case. It's very easy to scale from a development perspective. So first of all, what we, we get out of that, and uh, in here, I'm speaking about, you remember, when we saw the opportunities. So we have in marketing, and we have those other opportunities. This is related to the other opportunities, automation. So instead of taking hours for someone to manually say, OK, uh, this, is the, this is the name, and then type it in here, this is the age, and so on, it's in seconds, because it's fully automated. Um, the onboarding of new use cases, it might take one hour or maybe less, because if, if the models are in place, you just put them together, so call these different models, and that's it. And um, of course, in the very end, it's platform agnostic. So because everything is containerized, it's microservices oriented. This is basically the outcome. Just to present two use cases um, and uh, to show how in, we are, this is also making a, a, a bank data driven. Um, it's not 
In this case, it's not outbound, same as CVM, but it's still using data to automate the processing or the working of the bank as a whole. It could be the same in governments, it could be the same in insurance companies, car makers, and so on. Okay? Now, of course, um, those approaches, they generate new challenges. Um, the first challenge is this. So what is the best channel to, to use to reach a given customer? Um, some people don't watch TV anymore. Uh, so if you, if you decide to use TV, it's not going to be effective. Um, some people don't pay attention to marketing emails. So identifying the best channel is very complicated because especially if you, are, if you advertise in multiple channels, you don't know which one actually got the customer. So this is something that uh, is, is, still needs to be evolved. And it, it's, uh, it's actually true for the whole marketing space, in my understanding. The second thing is this. Uh, we have decreasing returns, and this is something that we were able to, to measure. So propensity is the score, is the, the probability that someone will take uh, an offer that we provided. And then we can see that based on, on the number of executed leads in here, this is uh, the increase in the number of sales. So it kind of peaks, and then it decreases substantially. So finding this number is complicated. And if you miss this number, if you miss this number, you get into this, which is something that we calculated as well. So, um, as you can see here, the green uh, line is the number of leads that were executed, and the blue line is the number of marketing consent, uh, uh, customers that uh, uh, removed marketing consent. So, if you remove marketing consent, you cannot be reached by any channel. So, if we keep sending leads, um, customers will start to say, okay, I don't want to hear from you anymore. And uh, yeah, so you see the, the type of problem that we have in here. Considering that we don't know the, the channels that work best for, or better for uh, each set of customers, this is a very hard problem to solve. Very, very hard. Um, another issue, of course, and this is again true for every industry, is that we are competing basically here um, with other banks, with other people. So we are competing for people's attention in general. So whoever works with B2C products, whenever you, you need to reach a customer, you know that this is true. Competing for attention these days is, is very tough because everyone is trying to get the attention of the same people. And uh, yeah, so given that, one thing that we also know that is it's very complicated to achieve when you, do, you, you don't own the platform, is to know, to keep learning about a different customer, is, is to know actually if, if your customer likes your product or not, and uh, if there's something missing or not. Because we know that people don't simply answer to those uh, uh, reviews or surveys that we provide. So identifying ways to keep watching a customer once a take-up has uh, happened. So, okay, I gave you a savings product. Now, how do I know if you're actually enjoying it? How do I know which other features you would like if you don't tell me explicitly? And uh, it's, it's something that I believe needs to improve substantially. And the other thing is, uh, and I'm very optimistic about this, and I, I, think, yes, I think it's going to catch up. It's going, it's, it's going beyond banking. So um, think about it. You, you have your internet banking. You log in there. So if you get your salary through that specific bank, the, we pretty much know how much you make, how you spend it, how often, where, you know. So why is it that I can't also offer you a holiday trip? And instead of you going to Google or to, 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 to look for it or some other provider, why can't, can't I go to my internet bank and say, okay, I want a holiday trip? And then a, a network of partners would offer me that. So this is very interesting. You can offer other products like, for example, buy now, pay later. This is an opportunity that can be brought. And then, of course, that would substantially increase competition. And then for us customers, it would be awesome. So I think this is something that I, I have seen it happening uh, in some banks uh, offering some interesting products like this. I think it's going to catch up. Yeah, this is what I think is coming in the future. And of course, uh, this is very cliche, very, very cliche. But 
This, I, I believe it was said by Abraham Lincoln, at least is what Google tells me. That the best way to predict the future is to create it. Of course, it's, it's very hard to, to accomplish, but I think that if you have scale, so scale in this case is if you, have, if you can reach many people, if you have the financial resources to deploy, you can actually make this kind of difference. So there is some kind of mission in here to be accomplished, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so I would just recap and, and so for us to discuss something if you have questions. So the recap is this. We talked about the amount of data that we have, the, the possibilities in, in computing, like in technology, that we can leverage. But then we also talked about how hard it is to get data, how hard it is to streamline operations, um, how hard it is to define the boundaries different between the different functions that we have, and then possible approaches uh, to solve those problems. Uh, so we talked about creating, uh, adopting open source, everything is, uh, of course, it's very uh, standard in the industry these days, but being able to contribute back, creating your platform on top of that, how that, that can help a lot. And then, of course, the moment you're able to leverage the data and you start to reach people with leads and, and, and things like those, what are the new problems that arise? So I can reach you, but if I reach you too much, you, want, want, you, you don't want to talk to me anymore. So we remove consent. So that's a problem, optimization problem. And what is it that we can do in the future? So uh, which platforms, which technologies can we put in place so that we can learn more and, and close this feedback loop in here? between the service providers and the customers. I would also like to say that um, I, I, I haven't put it here, so shame on me, <laughs> but we do have uh, open positions. So if you guys, if, if you think you can solve some of those issues that uh, I have presented in here, so if you, if, you, if you know how to solve that retention issue, if you know how to optimize the number of leads, maybe using some reinforcement learning. If you like to play with data engineering, you would like to help establishing a platform. If you like DevOps, everything related to those platforms, we have open positions. Um, uh, I haven't put here my social network. I'm not much of a social person, but uh, if you go to LinkedIn, Felipe Melo Absa, you might be able to find me. Feel free to connect. I can provide more details. And uh, of course, I would like to say special thanks here to the people I work with, so the CTO space at ABSA, the data solution space, which is where I'm working, the tooling and cloud teams, and of course yourself, and to build stuff, uh, because uh, this event is amazing, and I think it's wonderfully organized. This is what I had to present. Hope, I hope, that some of you are working on something like this, and that it, it maybe it could help you to, to see it different, or to see it from a different perspective. Hope it was useful at all. Happy to take your questions if you have. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, let's go straight to the questions. Who wants to build their own data-driven bank now? <laughs> Anyone? Uh, do we have a weekend coming up? Okay, I'm coming with the microphone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so how much time did it take for you to go from zero to a feature? Approval. For feature approval, you mean? Yeah, like uh, you already talked about the feel like uh, uh, like uh, you had nothing pretty much right at the beginning, and then the first uh, like product or future that you 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 got like how much time did it take for you? Ah, okay, yeah, I got it. So I think it was around nine months plus the time to establish the data engineering platform because the the, the the thing goes pretty much like this, and it, it happened in, in the whole industry. So data, someone said that data scientists, some influencers said that data science was the most exciting job ever. Lots of data scientists started to be hired, but then they realized, okay, there's no data. <laughs> so they started to be fired. So let's say one or two years to establish the data engin engineering platform. From the moment we had the data, around nine months to get to the first uh, iteration, and then from there on, every like we can deploy a new, a new model in one month. I have another one. Uh, 
so Please. basically, uh, uh, when it comes to the data itself, like, you know, it's like the plain data, you don't know anything about the domain and anything. So do you feel like it's uh, important to know the domain to actually deliver those uh, new features and uh, stuff? Absolutely, like that? absolutely. So one thing that we have established is, is basically we, we treat each model as some kind of product. And then we, we, put, we created this idea of, of course, actually we borrowed the idea of having a customer uh, success analyst, which is the, the, the new name for product owner that we had. So we have someone doing the interface between the business and the data science team. So someone is basically asking the questions to the business and making sure that the, que the questions are being answered by the data science team. So this is how we establish the communication. Because if we try to connect both directly uh, the data scientists don't speak business, the business doesn't speak tech, so we just put someone in here to bridge them. That's, that's basically how we have solved it. And without doing that, yeah, there's no way to, to move forward. It's like trying to find the right solution for the wrong problem all the way around. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Any more questions? Uh, yeah. Coming. Uh, hi, uh, thanks Hello. for the presentation, and my question is, why did you choose to go on-prem, for example, instead of uh, AWS or something like that? Sure. So, it's because of uh, legislation. Um, the, I'm sorry. Um, the situation was that there, is there, is, there was legislation in place that forced the data to stay in the country. So, there was no data centers available in South Africa. And I did the closest one was in Dublin, I believe. So we could not move the data in there. Yes. So then uh, AWS, or actually Amazon, built a data center in South Africa. So now it became possible. So we, are, we started the journey. Interestingly, though, it seems that once the data center was, was established, they started to change the legislation. <laughs> nice. Any questions? Oh, OK. Uh, I'm coming. Um, I'm just curious about what uh, kind of bank APSA is, like its position in the country, how long it has been around. Um, so the, in terms of position, I think we are this, this, the, the biggest in number of customers. I think the second biggest in terms of revenue, in, it has been around the way it is uh, right now, I believe since five years ago. Because before that, it was also part of Barclays. So there was a Barclays Africa. And, uh, and then five years ago, uh, Barclays uh, basically sold its, uh, its uh, stakes. And then it became as, as it is. But I believe it's, much, it's actually much older than that. I, I forgot the name, shame on me. <laughs> but ABSA actually means something like an organization of banks. But in South Africa, it's, it's very well established. It's among the top two. Great. Any more questions? Uh, if no, let's give a round of applause. Thank you very much, Philippa. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you all. Oh, we'll have one more presentation in uh, 15 minutes.